Good morning. This is Pastor Jason Bratcher, and welcome to Hartford Baptist Church. We're glad that you've decided to join us today in our time of worship unto Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, through singing of praise, sharing our tithes and our offerings, and the reading and preaching of the God-breathed Word of God. We invite you to come to our facility at 415 Liberty Street, Hartford, Kentucky, next to the Community Center. Our traditional service starts at 9 a.m., Blessed Academy, Sunday School, at 1015 a.m., and our contemporary service starts at 1115 a.m. The Kingdom Kids Ministry, or Children's Church, as well as our nursery is provided in our 11.15 a.m. service. The registration table for those ministries is in our education wing and begins at 11 a.m. At Hartford Baptist Church, we're a community of grace, serving a community of needs. May God bless you through the services here today. Turn the CD. This was the one thing you didn't see coming in. No one would blame you. If you cried in private, if you tried to hide it away, so no one knows, no one will see if you stop believing. morning everyone and welcome home are we ready to have a great day of worship with our Lord Jesus Christ yes will you stand with us and prepare for worship we're gonna sing about the blood of Jesus Christ nothing but the blood Jesus. 
the blood that was shed from your only begotten son that is atonement for our sins. And Lord, um, thank you. Thank you for sending your son uh, to, to, for salvation for us. Heavenly Father, there is no other way to salvation but through you. And so, Lord, thank you to offer up our offerings to you now, Father, as a way to say thank you for all of your provision, Lord. And thank you for the, the pleasure, the honor of being here in your house today with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. In your heavenly name I pray. Amen. Can we say it together? All God's people said, Amen. Amen. We have the power in the name of the Lord. Amen. Now the world wants to tell us there's power everywhere else, but let me tell you, my power, our power, the strength of power comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. We want to welcome you this morning uh, as we've set aside a time of uh, service for the ordination of Jonathan McCree and the pastor of Overseer. So we're glad you came today. We're excited about this uh, privilege to be able to do that. And with that, I would like to ask Brother David uh, C. Brown, Chairman of our Deacons, to report on behalf of the Ordination Council. Good morning. It is my pleasure to announce to you that the deacons and other ordained men of the church, having held an Ordination Council meeting, proudly, unanimous, unanimously, have a hard time saying that, unanimously uh, report that we present to you Jonathan McCree for ordination to the ministries. So at this time, I'll turn it back over to you. Brother. You know that... Uh,
just happened last night at the ordination council. It is us as a church, as we have saw or have seen Jonathan serve here in capacity and watched him grow and watched his influence as a Christian man. The third thing, after evaluating that man, the church leaders lay hands on him to show a blessing and continuity of leadership. So later on in the service, we're going to have laying on of hands of ordained men. And that's to show that they welcome him into that level of leadership and that they were going to show and endow upon him bestow upon him their abilities and leadership themselves. And the fourth thing is the purpose of ordination is to recognize men whom God has called. I do not want us to get mixed up in that we as the church, as the people here, have called Jonathan. God has called Jonathan to ministry. What we, amen, what we are here today is to affirm that calling and to ordain him as the people, the church, to that calling of God. You know, the, the scripture that we read doesn't describe an ordination, but rather what we would call today a commissioning service for missionaries. If you remember when we sent our missionary team to Ohio a few weeks ago, these are the scriptures I used for that as we did a, a service to lay hands on and to send them out. This was more of that type of uh, situation as they sent Paul and Barnabas out on their missionary journey. But we can see the similarities to the ordination process here. And we can at least find some principles here that apply to ordination. So let's talk about the ordination. An examination of the word ordained does not give us a clear biblical direction for any practice of ordination. But we do find help in three passages in the scriptures of laying on of hands. 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 5, and Acts 13, which we read this morning. And they all show a common practice of ordination. 1 Timothy 4, 14 says, Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of eldership. You know, what this verse refers to is a time in Timothy's life that comes the closest that we can find to what a, an ordination service is today. There's three questions that us as a church, we need to look at as we look at this text. Who ordained? Who ordained here, uh, Timothy? A body of elders ordained Timothy. These men, they may have been from the church there in Ephesus where Timothy was pastoring. We don't know that for sure, but we do know that they were qualified, biblically recognized group of men that had the authority to ordain Timothy. Then we look at the question, what did they actually do? The elders laid their hands on Timothy at that special service. And again, laying out of hands was associated with bestowing a blessing of continuity of leadership onto Timothy. And that's what we will be doing here today. So they're laying out of hands by the elders. They were already church leaders. They showed that they recognized that Timothy was also qualified and that Timothy was also equipped for ministry. And they bestowed their blessings on him for the office. They were symbolizing the, not, the, the, the actual continuity of leadership and engulfing him into that. Well, all this is nice and neat, but what's the purpose? The text here that we read seems to indicate three purposes for ordaining Timothy. And church, I want us to look at these because this is our charge. This is the charge, and I said our because I'm a, a part of Hartford Baptist Church. This is our charge, our responsibility to the ordination of Jonathan McCree. First of all, is we need to recognize and set apart Jonathan as one who was called of God and qualified for ministry. That's what we're doing here today. The, the event of ordination marks a point of officially or, or recognizing the work of God 
in the life of Jonathan McCree. The second thing is we as the church have to safeguard Jonathan's ministry. The practice of laying on of hands is a way for the men who've already been approved by their peers of like mind for ministry, allowing only called and qualified men to enter into it. We will be practicing that here shortly. And the third thing is we as the church need to encourage Jonathan. You know, Paul urged Timothy to remember his ordination and the gift that had come at that time by the means of encouraging him when things got rough. Remember your ordination. And I will be telling that to Jonathan here later. Later, Remember your ordination as encouragement as times get tough. Church, we have a responsibility in this affirmation to encourage Jonathan in the midst of of his ministry. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 22. Yesterday afternoon as we were in our ordination uh, uh, council meeting, Brother Hanson was there and he he quoted a scripture and and he didn't know it but I already had it in here but I'm going to say that I stole it from him because it sounds good when I stole it from Brother Hanson. But in 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 22 says, Do not lay hands on anyone hastily. And as Brother Hanson made that, uh, 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 quoted that scripture, he says, I don't think Jonathan was even in there. We were already talking about whether to affirm. And he says, this man is tested and tried. He's prepared. Church, we can't take this responsibility of ordination lightly. We can't take on this affirmation of this calling lightly. It is our responsibility. This is a scripture that's got to be taken seriously. And we, the church, must be confident. We must be prayerfully committed to do our part in the affirmation of God's calling of Jonathan McCree. I'm going to ask you a question this morning, and it does require a response. Hartford Baptist Church, I ask you in the presence of God and the Holy Spirit, do you accept these challenges that we have been put to before you today in this ordination of Jonathan McCree in this office of overseer? We do. I take that as an awesome yes. Worship team, would you lead us?
it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. It never runs out on me Love never gives up on us. Amen. I asked them to sing that song as, as the next part of the service. I'm going to give a charge to Amber. And uh, I told Jonathan, I said, tell her I'm not going to attack her. Because this is unusual. A lot of people don't do that. But uh, in Jonathan's call to the ministry, it's his family call to the ministry. It's his wife, it's his children, and those that surround him. So I want to give a charge to Amber this morning. And there's four marks of being a biblical wife that I want to read to you this morning. And uh, Proverbs chapter 31, very familiar to everyone. Uh, I'm going to pull out some scriptures there in that chapter to read this morning. If you would, stand with me again as we honor the reading of God's Word this morning. We're going to begin in verse 13. Proverbs 31, verse 13. She selects wool and flask and works with willing hands. Verse 15. She rises while it is still night and provides food for her household and portions for her female servants. Verse 16. She evaluates a field and buys it. She plants a vineyard with her earnings. Verse 18. She sees that her profits are good. Verse 19, she extends her hands to the spinning staff and her hands hold the spindle. Verses 21, she is not afraid of her household when it snows and all in her household are doubtly clothed. Verse 22, she makes her own bed coverings. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Verse 24, she makes and sells linen garments. She delivers belts to the merchants. And then down in verse 27, she watches over the activities of her household and is never idle. You may be seated. So Amber, this morning, there's four marks that I want to give to you specifically this morning. And the first mark is a worker at home. It's clear that God has given home, the home, to the woman and that's their domain. Men are called to lead and provide for their family. And we're called to care for our home and our family. Now, this isn't to say that a woman should, not, should only be in the home, nor is it to say she could never work outside the home. So is that old saying says here this morning, I want to say to you, don't hear what I'm not saying this morning. What I'm saying is this. A wife's primary responsibility is their home. We see that God calls women to be workers at home lots of times in scriptures in Titus and in 1 Timothy and absolutely here in Proverbs 31 about the virtuous woman. 
But instead of feeling discouraged at how much the Proverbs 31 wife does, you should be, feel encouraged by the example and strive to emulate some of those things. God gives the home to the wife and her domain, Amber, is the home. You should strive to be a hard worker at home. The second mark is love. You know, all Christians, all of us are called to be generous with our love to one another, but wives are specifically called to love their family. Older women are instructed to train the younger women in how to live a godly life. T uh, Titus chapter 2 verses 4 and 5 says, And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. The kind of love, Amber, that God calls wives to isn't conditional. And it's not based upon feelings. This is the kind of love that you cannot fall out of. It's an optional love. It's not an optional love. It's a commandment. Martha Peace, in her book, The Excellent Wife, wrote a, a, an awesome uh, piece, and I'm going to quote that this morning. Godly love is not primarily a feeling. It's a choice. It will help you show love if you will think, objectively or biblically, not subjectively or based on your own feelings. The third mark I want to charge you with this morning is respect your husband. You know, we today, if we turn on what I call the boob tube, the TV, and we watch any type of family show on there, they portray husbands as goofballs not responsible enough to do anything but to sit around with their feet, feet propped up, most of them a beer in their hand, watching a football game. That's what we see on the television set today. But as Christians, we know that that's not what a godly husband should look like. Yet Christian women today, as a whole, treat their husbands like the wives they see on the television set. They scold their husbands, treat them like their children, but that's not how God instructs the godly woman to act. Ephesians 5.33 says, However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Often, when a husband loves their wife the way that they should, it's easy for a wife to respect her husband. Amen? Likewise, when a wife shows respect to her husband, it's easier for them to show love the way that they should. So Jonathan, love your wife the way Christ loved the church. Make it easy for her to respect you. And the last one, and I'll get a big whoo on this one, submission. I didn't get one. Because let me tell you, submission is a pretty touchy subject today in our society. But it's clear what Scripture teaches on the subject of submission. Those who find excuses in order to ignore are doing just that. They're making excuses and not looking to Scripture for the final authority. In a biblical marriage... Both spouses are striving, should be striving to live God-like lives. The husband would ideally lead his wife lovingly and she would graciously submit. So Amber, I ask you, before God and all these witnesses, do you accept the challenge of being an overseer's wife with all the things that I've just made known to you? is for you and for Amber that whatever lies ahead for you both that God has within the ministry that you would be able to say it is indeed well with your soul and that we as a church would be able to say the same what God has ahead for us at HBC may it always be well with our soul Wait. 
I do pray that all is well with you today because this is a pretty important event. Ordination is important in a man's life. It's a huge event. If God has called you to ministry this morning, you need to aspire to ordination. You don't usually ask for it yourself. The church should do that. 
But still you can aspire to it. You can desire it. You can move towards that in your life. Don't fear ordination. You know, the process is difficult. It's challenging. But let me tell you, it can be a great blessing as you study the scriptures and as you express biblical truths in your life. Your ordination will be an event you can lean on later as confirmation of God's call to the ministry. So I take just a moment this morning that if you know you've got a call on God, God has got a call on your life, aspire to ordination. It's an awesome time in your life. And that leads me to the charge to Jonathan this morning. Titus chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. And I'm going to ask you to rise one last time with me this morning. Titus 1, verses 6 through 9. An elder must be blameless, the husband of one wife, with faithful children who are not accused of wildness or rebellion. As an overseer of God's household, he must be blameless, not arrogant, not hot-tempered, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, not greedy for money, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, holy, and self-controlled, holding to the faithful message as taught so that he will be able both to encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict it. You may be seated. The Bible specifically speaks about the qualifications for those who will lead people in the name of Jesus Christ. These qualifications have been here for over 2,000 years and Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of all of these qualifications and he is the senior pastor of the church. Amen? Amen. So this is an overarching summarization of characteristics that basically is in one characteristic, one thing, and that's to be above reproach, Jonathan. So Jonathan, I'm going to ask you to come and I'm going to ask you to stand right here this morning as I give you this charge. In living a life above reproach, it's not only the first requirement, but it's also repeated here. The other items that are listed, they explain what above reproach means. And if we pursue this list, And if we go even into 1 Peter, in between the two, we find 17 qualifications. This morning, I'm going to go over those with you and give you a charge in each and every one of these. You see, as an overseer, the first thing is you must be devoted to your wife. One woman man, so to speak. The overseer's marriage illustrates Christ's love for the church. You know, his bride. An overseer must love his wife exclusively with his mind, his will, and his emotions, not just the body. An overseer's children must be in submission. They don't have to be perfect. Yeah, I see. Thank God they don't have to be perfect. If a man does not know how to manage his family, he won't know how to take care of God's church. The first flock of the shepherd is his own family as shepherd dad. An overseer's qualification for the church starts in his home management as he leads them up in the discipline to admonishing the Lord Jesus Christ. An overseer is also a faithful steward. He's a steward, a manager of God's resources and Jesus' flock. He takes responsibility, but not ownership. An overseer must be humble, not arrogant. An overseer must constantly demonstrate the gospel by admitting when he is wrong and assuming responsibility and restoring his relationships. 
An overseer must be gentle, not quick-tempered. No man will be of any use to the kingdom of God that is quick-tempered. The difference between how Jesus demonstrated anger is that he was angry at the abuse of the others in the name of religion and the dishonor of the Father. Can't be short-tempered. An overseer must be sober. Goes on to say, not a drunkard. And this is not overindulgence only in just alcohol, but it's true for any behavior that fuels addictive responses. An overseer must be peaceable or peaceful, not violent. That's going to be hard for you. You're a pretty violent guy. <laughs> a pastor is not to be prone to inflict violence through not only physical means, but words as well. He's to be a peacemaker. An overseer must have financial integrity. In other words, not greedy for your own gain. An overseer is to be upright in his financial dealings and not accused of pursuing money over the kingdom of God. An overseer must be hospitable. An overseer's home is to be open for others to enjoy. An overseer's home is to, it's not a heaven here on earth, uh, but rather a place of ministry. And an overseer must be a lover of good. An overseer genuinely loves what is good. He does not just think he should love it, but he must be a lover of good. An overseer must be self-controlled. Self-control is a, a characterization of every area of your life. Your diet, your time, your mouth, your exercise, your relationships, sex, and money, all of those things are self-controlled by your characterization. An overseer must be upright. He has integrity in all of his relationships and how he treats others in those relationships. An overseer must be holy. His life is devoted wholeheartedly to Jesus, externally and internally. An overseer must be able to teach. All the other qualifications are character qualities so far. But this one is ability-based. He is to be able to teach sound doctrine, not just to be able to communicate in a, in a great manager, not to be a great or, orator, but to be able to teach. His teaching can be, uh, can be to one it can be to two, to twenty, or to thousands, but you must be able to teach. Most of the churches that were in Crete were house churches. The elders were to defend the faith, faith once they delivered the saints in the numerous false teachings that arose. We need people to stand in the gap to teach diligently the doctrine and the gospel of the faith of Jesus Christ, not just to speak. An overseer must be spiritually mature. Positions of authority without spiritual maturity lead to the trap of pride. When pride grows in a man, sin abounds. So I charge you to be spiritually mature. In church, that's part of our responsibility is to hold accountable and still to be teaching. An overseer must be respectable. That doesn't mean everybody's got to like you. Not everybody's even got to appreciate you. But it means there is no credible witness to an ongoing sinful behavior in your life. Trust me, in ministry, not everybody's going to like you. But they should never be able to fault, fault you in anything as sinful behavior. An overseer must be an example to the flock. Elders, overseers are example of biblical expressions sexually, time management, marriage, parenting, worship, relationships, in any other way. The list goes on and on. An overseer should be someone your sons could partner their life after and the kind of man that a daughter should marry. I want to read to you 1 Peter chapter 5. Verses 1 through 5 is part of your charge. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. I exhort the elders among you 
as a fellow elder and witness to the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed. Shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not out of greed for money, but eagerly, not lording over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. In the same way, you who are younger be subject to the elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Jonathan, I ask you this morning, before God and all these witnesses, do you accept these challenges of this charge to be all these things, to strive to do all these things that before God and the world. At this time, I want to ask Jonathan to come and kneel here before the altar. I want to ask Amber, if she would, to come and sit in one of the chairs here, if you would. And uh, I'm going to ask any of the ordained men of the church that would like to pray over Jonathan, uh, if you would, to form a line on this side over here, if you would go ahead and come now and just form a line right over here. We're going to lay hands on Jonathan as the praise team leads us in worship, and we're going to pray over him for just a few moments. So if gentlemen would come.
else here in the church that would like to come and pray with them, bless them. Lord, would we like to ask you to come do that now? So we'll open that up to anyone that would like to come and pray with them.
Everyone, if you extend your hand toward them this morning, we're going to pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to lift up this ministry and this family unto you. Lord, as we as Hartford Baptist Church commission Jonathan in the role of ministry, Lord, we also commission Amber, Sawyer, and Rowan in the same ministry. And Lord, we offer them up to you, and we pray, Lord, that you would lead them in the ministry, in their home, in their lives. Lord, I pray that you would put a wall of protection around them, protect them from the evil, but Lord, I pray that you also build them up so that they would take the weapon of your word and use that to fight off all dangers. Lord, we as the body of this church thank you 
for the opportunity to serve alongside this family. And Lord, we thank you for the years to come of service from this family. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for this time that we are here together. It's in your precious name I pray and all God's people together said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated, guys, if you like. Or if you just like to be up front, that's fine, too. Yes. Now, I want everybody to make aware. I'm getting ready to ask Jonathan to share with us his testimony. But, Jonathan, here's your first mountain to climb in the pastor position. Time's already up, so this is going to get blamed on you, okay? Not on me. I got done on time, okay? But if you would, Jonathan, as he comes to share with us his testimony. Thank you, church, and everybody who was able to come up and pray and those who prayed from their pews. I do appreciate everything that has been done today and said today and I, I feel the love I feel the Holy Spirit and just thank you so much for the support that you're all offering the uh, Jason may if you've heard my testimony before Jason may just scared you because if you hear the full thing it can take about I think at Shane Tucker's about an hour long you're not getting that it is a much abridged version of that so um, Can I do excommunication now? Can we start? <laughs> uh, but it, it, it is much shorter. But I do want to start with some scripture that I want to I lead with here. And I'm going to Ephesians chapter 2, um, verses 8 through 10. And you'll be real familiar with the verse 8, maybe in verse 9, but verse 10 is where I'm going to focus at here. But Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. And for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one, no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Jesus Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. Paul doesn't say some of us have been created for good works or that most of us have been created for good works. He's, he's saying all of us here. All of us have a calling. My calling may be different than yours. And yours may be different than mine or Jason's. Some of us may be called to just be a witness at work. Some of us a pastoral role, youth minister role, maybe a missionary role. But th there is no such thing as a Christian who hasn't been called to something. If you think there is, you haven't read Matthew 28 or really any of the Bible because you see callings all throughout the Bible. Um, but all of us have some call laid on us. Um, you may be thinking, I've never heard a call of God. God's never called me to do anything. Well, he hasn't called you to sit in the pew. Uh, Justin Peters, a, uh, a pastor, I recently uh, read, read a sermon and made a, little, made a little picture of it. I think I showed it to Rebecca. He said, if you want to hear the word of God, read the Bible. If you want to audibly hear the word of God, read the Bible out loud. If you've not heard God give you a call on your life, just open the Bible. Start reading the Bible. And he, is, he has called us to do many of things. And you will see your calling in Scripture. I guarantee that. If you're not seeing that calling, then you need to make sure that you, you've been called to Jesus initially. That's your first calling to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Um, but my calling was a... Probably 25 plus years in the making. Um, me and my mom, we were, we were saved in a Pentecostal church. But we quickly found our way to a Southern Baptist church. But even when I was young, I, I felt like God wanted me to do something. I, I, I thought maybe like missionary. I don't know if it's youth or what it was, but God had some calling on me. Um, long story short, I got caught up in work. Um, I was working so much, it took me seven years to get through college. Is that what it was there? Seven years? Yeah. Yeah. Um, went along with it because I was just working so much and um, neglecting the call God had on me. Um, and as life progressed, working more, working more, life is really getting more miserable because I'm not answering God's call. 
Um, and God would bring a massive storm into my life over the course of, well, it, it had its peak, but didn't really subside for about five, four years. I'll say four years that I just fought against this. Um, a lot of the storms in our life, we bring upon ourselves. God is trying to speak through the storm to us. Now, granted, some of us may be like Job. You know, where we have, we're that model servant. We really haven't done anything wrong, but God still sends a storm to us. But in Job 23, uh, verse 10, he says, God knows the path I take, and when he's done trying me, I will be made pure as gold. Um, so even if you haven't brought this storm upon yourself, God is still trying to speak to you and improve you. But chances are none of us are like Job. Job was the, the servant of servants, so to speak. Um, Job was a, a upright man. Job, Job had it going on. Most of us are probably like, more like Jonah. Um, I was like Jonah. Um, Jonah had a calling. Jonah's calling, go preach to Nineveh. Jonah rises, goes the other way. He's, not, he's got other things to do that he wants, you know, he's, not, he's ignoring that calling. Jonah jumps on a boat. What happens? You know the story. Big old storm comes in Jonah's life. To the point, it's not only affecting Jonah, it's affecting everyone else around him. Their lives are in danger now because of Jonah's disobedience. Um, Jonah ends up in the belly of the well. Jonah repents and then the storm, his, his trial has subsided there. At least that one has um, but Jonah had to repent and give in to God's call to go preach to Nineveh. I'm much like Jonah in my calling, uh, where I neglected it, I ignored it. And not only did I suffer, I believe those around me suffered. Amber will tell you that she'll be first, like we had a rough point in our marriage, you know, towards the, the B, yeah, towards the end of the trial call, at the beginning of the acceptance. And it was rough in the marriage, but God used my kids to really target me, um, especially Sawyer. Um, my mom can appreciate this more than anybody else, and I, I probably get this from her. Well, I know I get this from her. Um, we have a tendency to put children above everything. You know, ourselves, others, God. Um, if you want, my mom is 90% sane, but 10% insane. And I say that she's here, so I can say that. Am I talking about it? Back? If you want to see the insane, do something to a kid or a grandkid. I'll tell you right there. She's got two granddaughters right there. Do something to them, and she will flip out. Full-blown insanity. Um, but, um, and, and, I, and I have that, had that issue with, well, I'm not as bad, but I have to, I have to watch that. Because my boys are, you know, they're, they have that tendency to be that idol in my life if I let them be that. Um, some of them may be money. Um, mine would, if I have anything I need to safeguard from, it would be my children. Um, and I, I believe that genetics, it's hereditary there, I believe. Um, but when Sawyer was born, he spent the first, I guess, two and a half months in the hospital. Um, for, and there was, uh, there was I'm going to focus on the big reason, the big concern that, that really scared me. Um, when Sawyer, he was a premature baby, nothing unusual for a premature baby to stop breathing. That happens. Um, those apneic episodes, not unusual. Um, but was unusual in Sawyer's case, as soon as he would stop breathing, he would turn blue instantly, and it was a bad blue, and it was hard to get him to start breathing again. There's other kids in the NICU who do the same thing. Well, they could quit breathing for like 30 seconds and still be, as, be completely pink. Sawyer's about five seconds, and he's blue as a smurf. And so they're trying to figure out, like, one, why is, he, why is, he, why is his oxygen level dropping so quickly? Eventually, they run an echo on his heart. And they see, they diagnose him with some condition. I can't, couldn't pronounce it if I could remember it. Um, but, you know, your heart takes unoxygenated blood from the body, sends it to the lungs, then pumps it back through your body. Well, half of Sawyer's heart, they said, was wired incorrectly. That it was taking half the unoxygenated blood, sending it to the lungs, then through the body. But the other half, it would take unoxygenated blood, and it was just running it, from the body back to the body. It was bypassing the lungs. So they thought like, well, maybe we can get Sawyer healthy enough he can go home. Um, but by the time he's two or three and he's running around, he's going to have to have open heart surgery. Um, well, Sawyer kept getting worse and worse and worse. Um, one episode was so bad that he was gray for a day. The only pink he had was around his eyes. Um, me and Amber differ on the number because this is, you know, you're, you're in a stressful situation anyways and the memory's not great, but Sawyer's oxygen level was 29 or lower. If that happened to us as adults, we're, we're brain dead. 
Um, but Sawyer had enough stem cells in his brains, he's able to repair that damage that, that would have occurred. But things were getting bad. And I literally asked God, like, because I knew this was my fault, that because I have ignored what God's want me to do, that I wasn't supposed to be working where I was working, doing what I was doing. And I felt this was on me, that God is speaking through me through this entire deal, ordeal with Sawyer. So I made a deal, like, if you will save my son, I will do whatever you want me to do. Go wherever you want me to go. Um, so we, me and Amber, make a decision that we're going to have to take Sawyer to Louisville so they can put him in Louisville Hospital under their treatment. And a very strong possibility Sawyer's going to need open heart surgery if he can come home. The first full day we're there, they did an echo of, of Sawyer. Um, and the second full day, we came back and me and Amber seen him taking Sawyer away again. We're like, surely they're not going to be doing some surgery or something to him without telling us. And we get to the um, doctor. She says, no, they're, they're going to run an echo of his heart. I'm like, didn't we do that yesterday? It's like, yeah, doctor wants to run another one. And I don't remember the conversation between me and Amber at this point, but I know in my heart, I'm, like, I'm thinking the worst, that they have seen something they can't fix, that this is where we're at. The... Uh, the rest of that, this was early in the morning, right after breakfast, and no, nobody said anything to us all day long about this echo. And we asked, and I was like, well, the doctor will get back with you as soon as he can. He'll get with you as soon as he can. The next morning, I see the doctor come. He's got his entourage of people. And I, I'm in my head, I'm thinking the worst, that he's going to tell me there's nothing he can do for Sawyer. He walks up to me and Amber and he just, he looks at me and he, and the first thing I can remember, it may not have been the first thing, but the first, he may probably said his name, but I don't remember his name. I don't remember that part of the story. The first thing I remember him saying is, I don't know if you believe in God or not, but if you do, you need to thank him. He says, I've looked, I've run two echoes on your son's heart since he's been here. And I was the doctor who originally helped diagnose him with the heart condition that he had from the original echo. He goes, what we've seen in the first echo of your son's heart, the, ne the next two echoes don't show that heart condition. It's like. <laughs> he goes, and he goes, he keeps going. He's like, I've, I've heard of this happening before, but I've never seen it. I've never seen something like this happen. He goes, I have no other explanation that this is a miracle, that this is of God. Anything else he said after that, I do not know. I do not remember. I'm just, you're kind of in shock at this point. Um, one, you, you know, you're, you're thankful that your, your son got a positive report, but I couldn't believe it. And I, I remember questioning like, well, did we just mess up the echoes? You know, was something, now was the first one wrong? Are you sure you're reading the right? No, I'm looking for a s scientific explanation. Something, because also in my head, I've got to quit my job. I haven't even talked to my wife about this. <laughs> And so I'm looking for like, okay, maybe something else is wrong. Maybe a doctor, maybe somebody in Owensboro messed up. And he's like, no, I was like, we, before, no, Sawyer has this wristband that those, was, I think it was around his ankle, I'll call it wristband, I think it was actually on his ankle. Um, before any test is done, they scan it. And actually, I've, I've seen them do this before. They'll, they'll go, they'll scan the bracelet and Sawyer's name populates in the computer. Then they do whatever they're doing. It keeps you from messing things up. He's like, it's, it was your son's heart. And I'm just kind of in, you know, I'm, I won't call it, I'm basically numb at this point. Um, but, and still didn't share any of this with Amber um, on the spiritual level at this point. And um, I managed to convince myself, which in a, what, another week after that, maybe Sire's home? Shortly after that, Sire's home. Um, no issues with his heart sense, no issues breathing. Uh, we basically just had to make sure Sire could eat correctly. And they gave him some reflex medicine and we were home. Um, in a short time. Uh, but I tried to justify, like, you know what, if I can work four more years, I can save enough money for Sawyer to go to college. God, I need four more years. And I even talked to Amber about opening these college accounts, you know, because I know I'm still not telling her the whole story, but, you know, I, I talked about opening this account for Sawyer to save enough money for college for him so he could go to school. Well, how much money in Rowan was born four years later. In that four-year window, you want to take a guess how much money I saved for Sawyer? Zero. Zero. I'm making excuses. Rowan's born, and uh, 
R Rowan had a minor, but well, I don't call it minor, it was still major, but he, a, a stint in Louisville Hospital as well for a seizure that was unexplained. Um, never happened again. Um, but God, through that, the unknown, the mystery, trying to find out what caused this seizure in, in uh, Rowan, um, I felt God speaking again. And I'm trying to justify, God, I just need, I got Rowan, I got two kids to put through college. I, I, no, I need to keep working. Still never saved a penny, didn't open up the account even that I had looked at and researched and everything else. Um, but work had just begun to get miserable. The storm, why, why maybe I got in the eye of the storm for a while, I'm now coming on the back end of the storm. And I'm, I'm working more, getting more pressure from the boss. Um, and everything that could go wrong just went wrong. You know, I'd come home from work and Sire would be crying because he hasn't seen me in so long. And he's, he may be, it may be 10.30 at night and he's still awake in bed, just staying up, forcing himself to stay awake so he can see daddy. Um, and the marriage wasn't good. Um, just because I'm in rebellion to the calling God has given me. Um, and to be honest with you, like at the, during these points, like I couldn't pray or read the Bible well at all because if I did it was instant conviction so basically I'd have to stop praying just to avoid God's conviction because you know it was as soon as you'd start there God it, there it is he's like why am I going to listen to you when you're not telling me what to do I've told you what I want you to do what are you what are you praying for I've already gave you the plan so why are you asking me anything else and so I had to pull away from that as well um, until I finally gave in and God God really you know he, he forced that door shut um, he forced me to where I am today and I, and I think it's what kind of what he did to Jonah he forced Jonah to that beach he forced Jonah to Nineveh to answer his call so as the back if the band want to go and come up um, I'm going to wrap this up so my, my my charge to you is basically not to repeat my mistake if God has a call on your life, and he does have a calling for you. We just read that in Ephesians. We're called for good works. And your good work may just be that Christian friend at work, that person who shares, got too far away from the mic there, that person who shares Jesus with your friends and your colleagues, your families. Or maybe he's called you to be a missionary. Perhaps you're a young person in the church and God has called you to be in a pastoral role or a missionary. Well, that calling has started today. Yeah, you may not be actually doing it until you're 25 or so, but he's, or later in life, but he's calling you now, so you need to be preparing for that right now. Because if you do what I did, you lose direction, you're going to get caught up in the things of the world. But if you have a storm in your life right now, and life just sucks, it's nothing is going right. We have a tendency to blame others for our problems, but look at yourself. Chances are we've brought the problem upon ourselves. And until we answer the calling that God has on our life, that storm is just going to get worse. You may find yourself in the eye of the storm and you think things are better, but things will get worse for you. And I just pray that you don't repeat the mistakes of me and other people you see in the Bible, um, but answer that call he has on your heart. And that calling, which I'm, I'm getting to Jason's invitation time, but I won't have to go this way. But maybe God is just calling you to himself. Maybe you don't know him. And that first calling he has for you is to accept his son as your Lord and Savior. And until you accept that calling, you'll have no idea what that calling for good work is. Until you accept your first calling, that is Jesus. abbreviate that very well but this morning has God got a call on your life we met today for the purpose of ordinating Jonathan and his family for this ministry but is God calling you to something is God calling you to himself this morning or is God calling you to a step just a little bit further outside your box this morning there's something going on in you that you need to bring it to God or maybe there's something in your life that you know you just you don't have a handle on it let me tell you Jesus does bring it to him this morning. 
leave it right here. You've heard me say many times, the altar of the Old Testament was a place that you brought dead things to to be burned up. This morning, maybe there's something in your life that is alive and well and kicking and it is tearing you apart. This morning, lay it down, die it to you, and let the Lord consume it. Whatever your need this morning, they're going to sing reckless love. And in this song, if you're not familiar with the words that well, it tells us that he'll leave the 99 to find the one. If you're a child of God this morning, you've claimed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, guess what? At one point, he left the 99 for you. And sometimes, even though you may be a part of the flock and you tend to wonder, he still will come looking to gather you back up. Maybe this morning you've wandered a little too far. Maybe it's time. Come back to him. Because he is calling you. He is calling you this morning. That story of the prodigal son, the Bible doesn't tell it this way, but I and in in Jason's mind, I see that dad standing at the front door of his home, looking out that window intensely, waiting for the sight of the son coming in his direction. And when he sees it, he flings the door open and he runs to him. I look at my father, the Lord Jesus Christ, is staring at me through that window and my times of life that I have strayed away and as soon as he sees me make an attempt back home he comes to me the Lord this morning is looking out that window at you all he's waiting for is to you to flinch his direction and he'll come running and meet you are you ready whatever aspect you're in. I'm going to ask you to stand as we worship this morning, and I want you to worship the best you can this morning, and that doesn't mean be the best orator of music this morning. What it means is, is I want you to give with all your heart and your soul and your mind time to Jesus Christ this morning. And if he's calling you here to this altar this morning, allow us to encourage you in prayer. You don't have to share a thing with me. Share it with Jesus Christ. He is the great mediator as we worship this morning.
Yeah, give the Lord praise. That's all right. It's fine. Has anyone got anything they'd like to share this morning or they'd like to say before we close? I know we went a little longer than usual, but I don't know about you, but I really don't care. God's here. Amen? Amen. I, wanna, I do want to end this with a reading of Scripture because this is a day of celebration. Psalms 150 says, Hallelujah. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty expanse. Praise Him for His powerful acts. Praise Him for His abundant greatness. Praise Him with trumpet blast. Praise Him with harp and lyre. Praise Him with tambourine and dance. Praise Him with strings and flute. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. Praise Him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 This morning, I know that you want to take time to congratulate the McCrees this morning. So downstairs, immediately following this, there's some cake and punch. Just a time of fellowship there. Not a big elaborate meal, but just time to fellowship. Maybe get to know them a little better. And I encourage you to spend time with them there this morning. So without anything else, we're going to have a prayer of dismiss. And we'll be uh, reconvened downstairs. And with our dismissal prayer, we're going to bless the uh, punch and the, the cake as well. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for the beauty of this day. Yes, in the sky, yes, in, in the sunshine outside, but Lord, for the sun that is shining in this sanctuary, the S-O-N of God. We thank you for the beauty of this day. We thank you for the call on this life, the call on this family. And Lord, I pray that we as the church stand up and we affirm through encouragement to this family. Lord, we thank you for passing them by our way. And Lord, I pray today that if there be anyone here that has cause in their heart of not understanding you, Lord, I pray before they leave this building that they would ask and they would come to know you. Lord, be with us now as we go to fellowship one another. Bless the refreshments that have been set before us. And I pray you receive a blessing from the nourishment in our bodies of it. It's in your precious name I pray. Amen. You may be dismissed.
for listening today to Hartford Baptist Church. Again, we're located at 415 Liberty Street, Hartford, Kentucky. Services at 9 a.m. traditional, 1115 contemporary with Blessed Academy at 1015. Nursery and Kingdom Kids available at 1115. If you would like to know more about our church, give us a call at 270-298-3701. Our office hours start Monday through Thursday at 9.30 a.m. Like us on Facebook or go to our website. Have a blessed day.